How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Emmy, aren't you coming up? Okay, you can hear me fine, can't you? All right, I'm just going to move the chair over. Okay, today we're going to talk about some of the things that God did, about him giving people just what they need, okay? So there was this place called Egypt. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. Okay, and there was Israelites there, and they were slaves. So God took them out of Egypt. Thanks, <laughs> Yeah, put those behind your back or something. Okay, so he took them out of Egypt, and it was kind of hard because there were a lot of people chasing them. So what he did is he made a path through the sea. Have you ever heard of that? Ben, have you ever seen anybody make a path through the sea? Have you ever seen the sea? Have you? It's really big. So he made a path, and they all walked through the sea. The, the dry bed, because the sea wasn't there. He gave them a cloud to follow and, <laughs> and a fire so they could see at night. And they kept walking and walking and walking, following the cloud, getting the fire at night. And then he gave them food. Food fill, fall, fell from the skies to fill their bellies so they wouldn't be hungry. And then at nighttime, the quail would come and then they would have meat to cook on the fire. So God took care of them. And this was a long, long time. He said, trust me. Trust me and I will give you what you need. Do you think he gave them toys? No. no. Why not? Okay. Did he give them a wee? No. No, because electricity wasn't invented then. No electricity? No okay. just only fire. Did they need did they need a Wii? No. Did they need toys? No. What did they need? Food, water. Food, water. Air. They just needed to survive. Stuff to survive, didn't they? God said, Trust me and I will give you what you need. Take just enough for one day. So what does that mean? Take just enough for one day. When they, he was giving them the bread and the bird, the quail, Ben. They could, they could survive one night. And okay. he gave them enough to survive one night and one day. So he didn't want them to take too much, did he? Don't take too much. Just what you need. Your needs are met just one day at a time, and then God says, "Let me worry about tomorrow." So he doesn't want you to worry about tomorrow. He says, let me worry about tomorrow. I will take care of you tomorrow. Let's pray together. Father, we trust you to meet our needs one day at a time. We trust you to meet our needs tomorrow. Thank you for sake taking such good care of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, Bonnie's going to be reading to us from the, the message. The scripture comes from John this morning. If you love me, show it by doing what I've told you. I will talk to the Father, and he'll provide you another friend, so that you will always have someone with you. This friend is the spirit of truth. The godless world can't take him in because it doesn't have eyes to see him, doesn't know what to look for. But you know him already because he has been staying with you and will even be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming back. In just a little while, the world will will no longer see me, but you're going to see me because I am alive and you're about to come alive. At that moment, you will know absolutely that I'm in my Father and you're in me and I'm in you. The person who knows my commandments and keeps them, 
That's who loves me, and the person who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and make myself plain to him. So ends the reading of God's holy word. One thing that I've noticed uh, since doing this, starting this about a year ago is that far too many people are falling asleep. So I, I you picked a bad day to sit in the front row. That's right, but they're closer, so but they don't fall asleep. Just so stay awake and you won't have to worry about it. But many thanks to uh, Ben Kurtz for allowing me to borrow this for just a second. Today we um, are second to the last of our movie series, Seven Days in Utopia. And today's title of the sermon is called God and Golf. And it starts off with a story that I like to tell because I think it's just a, a great story. It's about a little boy who's about five years old who one evening, one night in the middle of the night, falls out of bed. And he makes this terrible crash when he hits the floor. And so his mother jumps out of bed and goes running in and checks to see if he was okay. And the boy was fine. He wasn't even crying. He might have been scared just a little bit. But the mother said, Johnny, what, what happened? Are you okay? What happened? And he goes, I don't know. I probably just stayed too close to the same place that I got in. That's why I fell out. Now, isn't that true sometimes about our faith? Sometimes we just do enough to get in, but then we don't grow and go from there. We don't work on our relationship with God. We don't work on our relationship with Christ. We don't study more. We don't do devotions. We don't pray enough. We sometimes stay a little bit too close to where we first got in there. But we're Christian. We're there. Now, at the risk of sounding political, and as you know, I would never do that, Okay, But the question I have for you is, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Now, I don't mean presidentially wise. I, I meant with your relationship with God. Have you grown the last four years? Have you grown the last five minutes in your relationship with God? What have you done to improve that relationship? We oftentimes recognize that life gets in the way of improving our relationship with God. We get busy. The phone rings first thing in the morning, and the next thing you know, you're, you're at work, and, and you think, well, gee, I meant to do that this morning. I meant to go on my knees before I went any further. But I just didn't quite get to it, so maybe tomorrow I'll do that. And so you put it off till tomorrow. Then the same thing happens. Maybe, maybe you learn first thing in the morning that your kids say, you know, I've got this science project that's due tonight at school. I know that happens. And so next thing you know, it's, well, I'll get to it tomorrow. I'll start working on my faith tomorrow. And so it goes. It's kind of a circle that goes and goes. It's always easy to put that off just a little bit longer because you know you can always work with that. God will understand. He's got the patience for it. Well, in today's movie clip, the professional uh, instructor that's teaching our guy how to play golf, how to play golf professionally, gives him some terrific advice. Of all the clips that we've had throughout this, this series, this is probably the most amazing advice that he could give to him. Now to set the clip up a little bit, they're actually out playing golf and it starts to rain. Now the golfer that's taking the lessons from this guy um, has had some problems in his past. Throughout the movie, you will see that every time he messes, messes up on the golf course, misses a putt or drives into the, uh, the woods, his father is there watching him, and nine times out of ten, the father gets disgusted and walks off the course. So this guy has, the only way he knows to get approval from his dad is to do well in golf. And to do well in golf, it's indicated by the golf score that you have. And so he is dead set on improving that golf score only. And the guy that, uh, that plays the teacher is telling him, it's not just a golf score that's important. You've also got to 
have that relationship with God. You've got to be able to see God, you've got to be able to feel God, and you've got to be able to trust His love. So if we could look at the clip. It's going to rain. Ready for today's lesson? I can only imagine what you got to go along with today. Today we play golf. If you listen, there's a still small voice of truth leading us. Talking to us and telling you that you can see God's face, feel his presence, trust his love. Yeah. SFT. Huh? SFT. God bless you. Happy Easter. Did you catch what he said right at the end? Right after the guy got it, when he took the hand away and his eyes kind of lit up and he kind of went like that, he said, Happy Easter. Easter does not just necessarily mean the resurrection. <clears throat> what do you see when you see God? When you try to imagine what God looks like, what do you normally see? Some of us see a, a very old gray-haired man with a big beard and kind of a rough face and, and up in the heavens somewhere. Others of us see God in some sort of uh, uniform that's leading the charge. Yet others see lightning in the sky and, and such. But quite often we don't see God with a smile on his face. We don't see God with a hearty laugh on his face like this. That's not just a grin. That's not just a chuckle. That is a hearty laugh, like he's never heard one like that before. There's nothing wrong with that vision of God, of having a hearty laugh on his face, of feeling good about his creation. 
you got to be thinking, well, surely he's got a sense of humor, or otherwise he wouldn't have created the armadillo. Or what was he thinking about when he created the, the neck on a giraffe? What was he thinking? What was he thinking about when he um, came up with a mating call of an ape? Or what was he thinking when he had Jonas on the beach, just got spit up by the whale, dripping wet with gastric juices from a whale? What was he thinking then? Many of you remember um, the Art Linkletter show. For those of you that, that don't remember Art Linkletter, Art Linkletter, I believe, was one of the first talk show hosts, a uh, variety kind of show that was, took place during the daytime. And one of the segments that he became famous for was he'd have kids sit along uh, stools and he would interview each kid all impromptu. And the title of the segment was called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Remember that? There's one that stands out in particular. Art Linkletter goes up to the little boy and says, well, tell me, what do you like to do at home? And the little boy thought, he says, well, I like to play with uh, the toilet paper after my mom's finished with it. Of course, he meant the roll and wanted to look around. Got a big laugh on Art Linkletter anyway. <laughs> But God wouldn't have created little from the mouths of babes come those wondrous things. So when we look at God, it doesn't matter what we see. What does matter is that we have an impression, that we do have some sort of vision of what God looks like. And it doesn't even have to be a face. It can be something you see in nature. But it's unique to you. It doesn't have to fit anybody else. It's unique to you, and it's what you envision God to look like. The next thing he talked about was feeling God, feeling the Spirit. And did you know that we actually have a lot in common with Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz? We oftentimes will find ourselves in a strange land surrounded by strange people, which is what happened to Dorothy. Now, our path is not necessarily always laid with yellow bricks. And surely sometimes the wicked witch of the East wants more than our ruby slippers. However, we can relate to Dorothy. When she finally gets to the Emerald City, the comparison with Dor Dorothy gets very real. The wizard actually tells Dorothy that what the wizard actually tells Dorothy is what many people think is what God is telling us. You remember the plot. Dorothy and, and uh, the characters went to go see the wizard. Dorothy wanted a way home. The tin man wanted a heart. The straw man wanted um, brains. And the lion wanted courage. So the wizard says, I will grant you these things if you go and prove it take care of the source of all evil. And they said, well, how do you do that? Bring me the broom of the wicked witch of the east. So they were terrified. They were quivering. They were shivering. They didn't know what to do, but they headed on out to do that. So what they did was eventually, through a lot of plotting and planning, get into um, making wax, if you will, of melting the witch and actually bringing the broom back to the wizard. And then it's found out that the wizard himself is actually a fraud. You know, he's creating this great light show, but he's not really a wizard at all. And so they're very disappointed. But he does redeem himself by saying and telling um, Dorothy and her crew that everything they needed to do in life, everything they needed to have as far as strength and uh, to get things done, all they had to do was look inside themselves. They already had what they needed to accomplish what they were wanting to accomplish. The power is in you to do what you need them to do. Sound familiar? I will not leave you as orphans. I will send you a companion, a helper. Though you cannot see him, he will be with you and in you. It truly is an inside job. I remember... Um, 
back in the early 90s when Bonnie and I built our house at the dunes, as we're constructing the house, I thought it would be a good, Bonnie wasn't in favor, but I thought it would be a good idea to put in a uh, burglar alarm system. So we had one installed, and the first night that we spent uh, there at the dunes, we shut everything down, um, turned on the burglar alarm system, and, and went to bed. Sometime in the middle of the night, I had to get up for something, and all of a sudden, the burglar alarm goes off. So I said, never fear, Bonnie, I was going to show her just once again why she married me. I was going to go after the burglar. Plastic bat in hand, check all the windows, check all the doors, see where this cat was coming into our house. I couldn't find anything. Couldn't find any place where the windows were broken or the door was ajar or anything like that. So finally I went back upstairs, turned the burglar alarm system off, went to bed, got up again, boom, it goes off again. Well, this time a sheriff's car is out front of our house. So I'm walking around trying to realize, and then it dawned on me. We had motion detectors installed inside the house. So I went out to the sheriff's car and I said, I'm really embarrassed, uh, but this was my fault. Um, the problem is on the inside of the house, not the outside of the house. It's not someone trying to get in from the outside. It's me screwing up on the inside of the house. Now, isn't that typical of a lot of the things that we have problems in life? It's an inside job. It's on our inside. We oftentimes try to uh, blame a lot of other people for that. We blame Washington. We blame neighbors, schools, so on and so forth. Sometimes we even blame a church for things that go wrong. But the inside problem uh, needs to be addressed from the inside. Paul said in Romans, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. Real change is an inside job. You may change things for a day or two, working on it from the outside, but at the heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart. Walk each day with the Holy Spirit and talk to Him every day and watch your life and your relationship with Him change. The wizard says, look inside yourself and find self. God says, look inside yourself and find God. The first one will get you to Kansas. The second one will get you to heaven. It's your choice. Lastly, we talked about Trusting God's love. The movie talked about trusting God's love. SFT. In order for us to see God sometimes, in order for us to actually feel God sometimes, and in order for us to turn our lives over to the point of complete trust in God, we've got to slow things down a bit. We've got to slow our pace just a little bit so we can see the detail of what God is trying to do in our life. Slow it down to the point that we can actually see what happens. Here's an example of an interesting thing about what happens to a golf ball when it's hit at 150 miles an hour. really changes shape, doesn't it? Now, I've played with Mike before, and I know when he hits it that way, it goes straight up and changes those kind of shapes. <laughs> but that's a golf ball at 150 miles an hour, those hard golf balls. So we've got to slow things down. I don't know how many frames per second that is, but 20,000 perhaps. Slowed down, we can actually see what happens. One of the best examples of, of trusting God is told in a little fable. And the fable begins by talking about a little boy and his father that live in a home 
that are, it's in a valley with a lot of other cottages. And the problem is that this valley is at the bottom or at the end of a huge dam along a river. And the little boy has a job to do every single day. Every day the father goes off to work behind the house. And when he comes home at night, he always brings a wheelbarrow full of dirt. And he says to the little boy, I need you to fill these bags with this dirt every single day and stack them just as high as you can all the way around the front of our house. So the little boy complains, I don't want to do that. But he says, no, I know what I'm talking about. You've got to do this. So every night when the father would come home with a wheelbarrow full of dirt, the little boy would be filling up these bags and he'd start stacking them in front of the house. Soon he got the stack so high he couldn't even see over the top of it. But then he'd see little neighborhood kids running around playing with their own toys and their new stuff and that kind of thing. And he complained to his dad. He says, Dad, everybody, all my neighbors, all my friends have new toys to play with. All I have is dirt. And the father says, keep up the work, son. We've got to act fast, keep working hard. I know what's best. So the boy complained a lot, but he continued to do what his dad had asked him to do. All of a sudden, one day, they look up at the sky, and they see that it's getting very dark. And they see lightning, and they hear thunder. And it begins to rain. Unfortunately, the little boy had all these sacks all the way around the front of his house completed. Big high wall. Soon after all that rain came down, the dam broke and washed away the village. Washed away the village except for that one house. It gave them enough time to go from the front of the house to the back of the house where the father was working into a tunnel that he had made clear to the other side of the mountain up to the top of the mountain and they lived then happily ever after on the top of the mountain. Here's a case where the little boy did what he was told, but he didn't understand why. He didn't know that he should trust his father, that his father did, in fact, know best. God gives us everything we need. The father built his son that house and the tunnel. And what does our Father do for us? He gives us a wall of grace to protect us. We should not be worried about what others have, but we should be worried about whether or not they have what we have. Instead of being jealous for other people because of other people, we should be zealous for them in helping them. For heaven's sake, let's drop the wanting and the needs that we think we have and pass the cup there's plenty to go around one thing is for certain as we enter our father's house you will not regret what he did not give in fact you'll be stunned at what he did give trusting God is one of the greatest gifts that we can give God think about that trusting God is one of the greatest gifts that we can give to him Accepting his grace, accepting his love, and trusting him is a great gift. Think about the fact or the time when someone in your life gave you some time, actually sat down and said, let's talk. I've got a few minutes here. I want to talk to see what's going on in your life. They gave you their time. A very precious thing that people have is time. And didn't God do that for us? In John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Maybe John 3.16 should be, for God so loved the world, he gave his time. He came down to spend time with us. He gave his time to us. See him, feel him, trust his love. Let's all give back to our provider. The only way that we know how to do that he and his love can truly accept.